Thank you, Anna, for, fi for finding that song. That was something. Would you all stand and join with me saying the Congregational Covenant as found in your order of service? Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve others in community, Thus do we covenant with one another. Thank you. You may be seated. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Columbia. My name is Rebecca Drennan, and today I'm your service leader. Our minister is Reverend Stephen Robinson, and on those Sundays when Stephen is not in the pulpit, we present a variety of qualified and interesting speakers from this congregation and from the wider community, as we'll see today. So you have to come back and see. We never know quite who will be on the agenda, but uh, we're all grateful. Unitarian Universalism is a diverse and non-creedal religion. We are a covenantal religion, which means we don't have to believe the same in order to treat each other the same with respect, equity, compassion, and dignity. Our community is based on deeds and not creeds. As Unitarian Universalists, we side with love, embracing all people regardless of age, color, race, socioeconomic status, physical ability, or religious background. We are a welcoming Congregation, and that means that we embrace LGBTQ individuals, and we encourage everyone to wear a name tag. And uh, there are members of the board that are here. Uh, I wonder if you would stand so people could see leadership here. Yeah. To appear and way at the back. Thank you so much. At this time, we're going to have our chalice lighting, and I'm going to ask Don Cooper to come forward, and I'm going to read a little bit about this person that you always see as you come in. Don first came to Columbia in 1997 from a position as a research professor in the medical school at the other USC, the University of Southern California. Then he ran, there he ran a laboratory dealing with nerves and muscles in the larynx, which you may know better as the human voice box. It was in 1995 when living and working in Los Angeles that he became active in Membership Matters. A friend of his at the Emerson Unitarian Church in San Fernando Valley persuaded him to become active in greeting and he has been active in membership issues ever since. He says greeting is a very good activity for new members and friends since it automatically acquaints you with the other members in their lives and makes you known to them. The greeters and ushers serve tirelessly but need relief at times rather than working every Sunday for months on end. And Don is hoping some of you some of you will help them by stepping into a role of a greeter or an usher at times, just to give them a little rest. He'll be glad to help you learn these roles, and some of you may even find them enjoyable. As a Morgan McLaughlin commented recently when he took over greeting for one morning, thank you, Don, for your continuing faithful service to the community. Thank you. Got it. Perfect. Thank you. Spirit of light and life, come unto us. And now for a musical meditation. Our guest singer, Janice Klein, is unable to be here this morning. So instead of her selection, I'll be sharing a beautiful selection from Enrique Granado's poetic waltzes called Valse Sentimental.
Thank you, Anna. Um, I'm going to go to the back for the moment for all ages. And I wanted to show what we're doing this morning. Um, the DRE has many um, books in the library for children. And I told him today we were talking about diversity with children. And he guided me to um, a book, Whoever You Are. And I just wanted to share that. I know we have, have someone here. I'm coming down the line here. What do you see about these pictures? I see that they're all kids. Yeah, all kids. Yeah, and all colors. Look at all the colors they're wearing. Yeah, and some of the colors of their skin are different. Um, this little book, and I hope you'll take it out in the library, maybe later. Uh, it's all about uh, discovering that even though kids might look different or eat different things, or play different games, that they still have lots and lots of things that are in common with you. So once you start to play, the differences seem to uh, not be so important. Yeah, yeah. I bet you do that already in school. Yeah, yeah, lovely. Well, thank you, and I hope you'll look, look for the book. Our opening words today are by the poet Wendell Berry, and the poem is called Our Real Work, Our Real Work. It may be that when you no longer know what to do, we have come to our real work, and that when we no longer know which way to go, we have to come to our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. <laughs> the impeded stream is the one that sings. I'll repeat those two last lines. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sings. At this time, we have candles of community. If you have a significant personal joy or sorrow or concern that you would like to share, please phone or email the administrator by noon Friday. You may also share your joy or concern personally. We always have seven candles outside for our seven principles. They're in a basket on the table in the foyer so that when you arrive, you can take a candle or you can send in an email to the office and it'll be relayed to us. So at this time, if you have a concern or a joy, I ask you to come forward now, if you'd like. I think Keitha does. Keitha, can I bring this to you? Well, okay. I'm not sure I can hold that at the same time. There you go. Good morning, everybody. So the caring committee has been sending kind bars um, as snacks to the folks at Lexington Medical Center. Um, who are dealing with this 
really overwhelming pandemic. And I got a thank you from Donna Peel. She's the director of pastoral care there. Thank you so much. This was a very hard week and weekend. We lost staff members from the virus and a volunteer chaplain. The hugs accepted and appreciated. Please share our gratitude with your group and continue to pray for an end to this virus and strength to press on. So I would like to light a candle today for the Lexington Medical <coughs> staff, um, the ER staff, the ICU staff, and all the support staff at uh, LMC, the security, the receptionists, the cafeteria workers, everybody who support them. Um, and I would also like to extend the light, oops, <clears throat> light and spirit of this candle to um, our entire medical community and support staff as we all deal with this really overwhelming um, pandemic. And after the service, um, outside, I'll be circulating some cards, um, hopefully with the help of a couple of volunteers, for everybody in the congregation to sign. Um, I have three thank you cards, so please try to sign one. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Kate. I'm a kind of frequent visitor, I guess. <laughs> um, and I would like to share a joy for those of you who know Ann Cargill and Glenn White. Ann has come through her surgery, and she is doing uh, well, you know, on the usual recovery curve. And she'll be going home in the next two days or so. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that news. Hi, good morning, I'm Chuck. I have a candle of joy this morning because my brother, Scott Sargent, my kid brother, is finally a grandparent. Two days ago, he became a grandfather of a little boy named Gabriel Luciano, like the famous gangster. His picture is on the table in the back if you'd like to have a look at him and his mother. And Bud and I just recently became great-grandparents as of last April, so it's about time that Scotty finally had a grandchild. I want to light a candle for Bruce and Nick. Uh, we all who know both of them know that Nick has been fighting a very severe illness and we want to just keep him in our thoughts and Bruce is also uh, fighting along with him and that's overwhelming at times to a person too so we light this candle to you Bruce and Nick. Hey. Um, my name is Connie Quirk, and this is Kevin McKinney, my husband. I'd like to light a candle of concern for my mother, who is 98 and a half. A week ago, she took a bad fall, spent five days in the hospital, um, lost a lot of blood in the fall. Um, she's now in a nursing home, but has fallen twice since been going there. And they're keeping her in a lobby where they keep all of the very disabled elderly and she is beside herself. But she won't stop trying to get up and do things for herself. She's very stubborn. 
which was a great quality when she was younger. Not so good now. <laughs> um, so, uh, and for my older sister, who fortunately for us, because my mother's in a facility that is on lockdown and no one is allowed to go in and visit her, but my sister is an, a nurse for the elderly. She works at that place and um, is able to go in and check on her and have meals with her and, and do things like that. So, um, you know, we're all just kind of waiting. She said there's no point for us to come down because there's nothing we can do. We can't go in, we can't help. You know, we can't, she can hardly talk, so you can't talk to her through the window. Um, so anyway, this is a candle of concern for her. And I light an additional candle in memoriam marking two years since Blake Moore's passing. He was a doctor and husband of Janice Klein Moore and stepfather to Miles. Hello again. Sorry, I was running late today. Um, just want to say thank you. Caring committee, everyone has always been helpful here, especially for Nick and myself. Um, I light this candle for us, everyone. Thank you. We light one final candle for those joys and concerns that remain silent in our hearts. Emilio was so kind to remind me that I forgot to welcome visitors. <laughs> Thank heavens. Um, we would love it. If you're visiting, we would love to recognize you and to welcome you more. If you're willing and able, please rise and share with us your name and where you're from. Or if you have guests with you, please feel free to introduce them. Please wait till Emilio sends you the microphone. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul, and I'm here with my partner, Jennifer, and baby Maddie. I think she just went to feed Maddie. Uh, we're from right up the street, uh, but we just moved uh, here a few months ago, so really happy to, uh, to be able to join you this morning. Welcome, Maddie. Hi, my name is uh, Nathan Casasa, my wife, Lauren Chapman. Uh, we are also local to the area. Uh, happy to be visiting this morning. Oh, welcome. welcome. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi, my name is Will Robinson. I'm just visiting from Lancaster, South Carolina, and I'm here with my girlfriend. I'm Lucy Youngblood, I'm with the Frontera people and just delighted to get to visit with y'all again. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Hello, I'm Rowena Nyland and I'm here with the Frontero people. I just live two blocks away on Monroe Street uh, and we're all from Shannon Presbyterian. Thank you for having us today. Welcome. I'm Mary Ann Brearley. I'm also with the Frontera Group, and I'm from Columbia, and happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. 
This congregation contributes to what's called Share the Plate, where half of our cash collection each Sunday goes to local charities. It's a way for us to give back to the community that we live in. This month's uh, Share the Plate recipient is going to be introduced by <laughs> Linda. <laughs> Come on up, Linda. I am not Kim Dozier. Um, Kim called me early this morning to tell me that she has been exposed to COVID. She's been tested but hasn't got the results and she's already giving some symptoms. So I'm speaking on her behalf. She sent me quickly something that she would have shared with you about the Harriet Hancock LGBT Center. Um, this is what, Harry, what uh, Kim, is, Kim is sharing. We are celebrating Harriet Hancock's birthday this weekend, and so happy to share that one of the things that she has been advocating for most passionately is finding a way to celebrate our community in person again. We are working to find safe ways to reintroduce our monthly potluck gatherings that we have enjoyed. As a part of that process, we're working on the center's space. We've hired an executive director and we're working diligently to keep the community engaged in the process. Our Change Your Name, Change Your Life clinic continues to grow and reach and develop into a multifaceted program that will support the trans community in Colombia by encouraging authenticity and assisting with the legal process involved in achieving it. We are so grateful for the support of the church and look forward to sharing the impacts of our combined efforts to empower and lift up the LBGTQ community. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. If you are contributing by check, please write share the plate on the menu line, or you may also make an online contribution you'll find a link on the UUC website. I wonder if the ushers would come forward now. Our offertory music this morning is Cuando El Cobra with music by Jose Antonio Olivar and Miguel Manzano. <laughs>
We're thankful for these gifts and we'll be using them for the community and for this congregation. At this time, I want to introduce our two speakers this morning. Mary Rogers is originally from Bennettsville, South Carolina. She currently works as a social worker at the Doran VA Medical Center. Her interests including a group Together Women Rise that is a circle focused for nonprofits in the third world countries, hiking the Palmetto Trail and volunteering for assorted tasks at Shandon Presbyterian. And Michael Bird is a retired faculty member of the Arnold School of Public Health. Before that, Michael was at SC DHEC for 38 years and retired as State Chronic Disease Prevention Director. We welcome you both and uh, turn it over to you. And I'm Mary Rogers and I'm gonna be your briefest speaker. I just want to say uh, we did we prepared a 11 minute video that I ex think explains what sh the folks at Shandon Presbyterian did on the border of Mexico. You will notice that none of us are wearing masks. It was probably the last time any of us took a trip. It was January of 2020. So right before COVID hit is when we took this trip. The Sonora Desert, stretching thousands of miles from Mexico into Arizona. It's a sparsely populated Wild West landscape, ideal for bringing drugs into the U.S. or entering without documentation. It is here in this high desert, one can find out what's really happening at the border. I'm Mary Rogers. To learn more about our nation's immigration policies, 18 of us Presbyterians from Columbia, South Carolina, went to Mexico in January 2020. We board our flight with mixed emotions. We're excited, we're curious, and we're a little bit apprehensive. Mexico is not the safest place. By mid-afternoon, we're in Tucson, praying in the parking lot of a Mexican restaurant for wisdom and guidance in the week ahead. Then we head south to the border town of Douglas, Arizona. Our first stop, Don't US you love side the perseverance? of the massive wall. <laughs> we talk about I, I'm how sure we none of you have had any tech are challenges. expected to welcome the wandering stranger. <laughs> we all understand. And we stare at the razor wire and the unmistakable message it brings. Just After the service Douglas, today, we will be selling some Mexican coffee a barrier, that you actually get to see the name of the farmer on the bag. It is direct to farmer, and to it really vehicles. supports the goals the of what we saw as a need. Littering the Mexican side suggest it does not stop people. Finally, as the sun is setting, we drive toward the point of entry into Mexico and our home for the next five days. Agua Prieta. The following morning, a Sunday, we gather to worship at a small Presbyterian church, El Liro de los Valles. Worship is passionate and informal. At the end of the service, worshipers congratulate everyone who had a birthday the preceding month even Bob Brearley. Our visit is coordinated and hosted by a Presbyterian Board of Ministry, Frontero de Cristo. It is led by the Reverend Mark Adams. I'm a small town Southern boy. Adams is from Clover, South Carolina. We meet with him and his wife Miriam at their home in Agua Prieta. Adams came here 21 years ago, and he vividly remembers a Bible study at the home of Miriam's parents. The group discussed the book of John, which Mark says he had studied but never really understood until then. First person that spoke said, well, lo que, mayo, lo que me llamó la atención es que el verbo se hizo carne y habitó entre nosotros. What called, what called my attention is that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
And then he said, God knows what it's like to be far from home. In Agua Prieta, Frontero de Cristo supports partnerships that include a community center and school, a drug rehabilitation program, a vocational training center, and a cooperative for coffee growers. One of the most important partnerships is CAME. All immigrants seeking asylum at the Douglas Port of Entry must come through the Centro de Atención al Migrante Exodus. Inside, the pictures on the wall depict the dangers of crossing Mexico. This is Gael, an eight-month-old who steals the heart of Laura Covington. Gael's family fled their Mexican town with nothing but the clothes on their backs after a gang kidnapped his mother's brother. Of all the things we saw and experienced in Mexico, the children at Kame were the most powerful. We're still haunted by the images of two little girls clinging to one of the host. We were asked not to photograph them. The story of the two girls, ages six and nine, shows the human cost of our nation's immigration policy. The girl's mother had passed a preliminary screening that established that the family had a credible cause to claim asylum. In the past, the woman and the children would have been able to stay in the U.S. However, under a new program, the Migrant Protection Protocols, the family was returned to Mexico to await their next hearing. In November, the mother was kidnapped, and no one knows if the little girls will ever see their mother again. So our nation are, are taking folks who are fleeing extreme violence and are wanting to access the legal process for asylum and have implemented the Migrant Protection Protocol. And it's all about making the process more dangerous uh, and, and to increase longer, to increase the suffering and the pain, uh, to be a deterrent. Uh, because we as a nation have put a no room in the end. To learn more about the challenges migrants face, we head out of Agua Prieta and into the desert. We want to see and experience what they might endure as they journey to the U.S. border. Leaving the highway, we encounter some real cowboys. And we encounter mud, and that is a problem. So uh, we saw the uh, bus in front of us break, or go into reverse, and so we braked, and then our back tires slid into the mud, and uh, you know, the rest was history. We got stuck, so. Feeling better now, got some more confidence, stress level's down again, uh, but we'll see. Apparently we're going quite a ways and there are more of these, so you might see us stuck again. <laughs> Later, we leave the vans and continue on foot. On the move, we encounter a member of a local drug cartel. We do not have a picture of him. The man is in the desert to collect a toll, reportedly $500, from anyone who hopes to cross into the U.S. Our guide explains that we are a church group and the cartel member lets us pass. About 20 minutes later, we reach the wall. We learn about the hazards of the desert and we find out the wall has gates. On this day, they are closed but we are told they sometimes are open to let animals and anyone else pass through. Afterward, we gather at the Tree of Life. It's called that because in the past, water and food have been left here for migrants crossing the desert. It's a dangerous journey. Back in the U.S., Mark Adams leads a vigil for those who have died in the desert, 320 of them just in this county. Some will never be known. Agua Prieta is a poor community. 
Many roads are unpaved, dogs run free, trash litters the landscape, but that's not all of the story. One night, we come to a modest Agua Prieta home. This is Ada Casamiros cooking tortillas for us on a 55-gallon oil drum. Ada taught Edie McNeish and others how to do it. We ate so well in Agua Prieta. This is Chile, Colorado. The smaller dish is cactus. Our experiences in Agua Prieta make us want to do something. And as the week was drawing to a close, we had a chance to visit another Frontero de Cristo partnership. Dugla Prieta Works provides vocational training and promotes economic self-sufficiency. One area is horticulture, and we do our part for a good harvest this year. On our last day, we gather at the wall. In contrast to the razor wire on the U.S. side, artists have turned the steel fence into intricate murals. We hold hands and listen to scripture. Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. As we walk to the border checkpoint, we pass a cross declaring we are all immigrants. In the distance, we can see a green tent, which symbolizes how we treat those seeking asylum. The U.S. now limits the number of people who can apply, and asylum seekers never know when their name may be called for an interview. If an immigrant is not at the point of entry when their name is called, they lose their spot on the list. That's why Frontero de Cristo and its partners put up this crude shelter. As immigrants rise to the top of the list, they move into the tent so they will be here when their names are called. The tent does not have heat or running water. As we walk by, we talk to a Mexican couple with their infant daughter they have been waiting in the tent for one month. Meanwhile, drugs and people continue to enter the country illegally. We were told that the cartel removed this section of the fence so a vehicle could drive into Douglas. We leave Mexico in our muddy vans. We're angry. We want to know what we can do when we get home. Well, Jesus was about crossing borders. And this is a border, sometimes it's easier to cross this border even with the fear that exists than the borders that exist in Colombia. Mm -hmm. And so what are the borders in Colombia that separate you uh, from your brothers and sisters that you haven't met yet? We have so much to remember from our experiences. The Christian hospitality and the delicious meals, the challenges of Google Translate, time spent together. We learned a great deal at the border, thanks to Frontero de Cristo. Muchas gracias for what you gave to us, 18 missionaries from Columbia, South Carolina. so much to remember from our experiences. The Christian hospitality and the delicious meals, the challenges of Google Translate, and time spent together. We learned a great deal at the border, thanks to Frontero de Cristo. Muchas gracias for what you gave to us, 18 missionaries from Columbia, South Carolina. Thank you, and Michael, I want to give you the, um, would you like to use this? Yeah. Yeah.
Thank you all so much for having us here today. 52 or maybe 53 years ago, uh, I went to a different part of Mexico as a part of the American Friends Service Committee work that they were doing at that time in the uh, state of Morelos, which is south of Mexico City. So way down south, uh, if you know, know a little bit about uh, geography, Agua Prieta is right below Douglas, Arizona. Uh, and uh, I've heard of uh, Make America Great Again. You could also say uh, Make America Mexico Again because uh, about a third of what is now the U.S., all the way from Wyoming, California, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Texas all used to be part of Mexico, uh, was taken from them by you know who. But anyway, uh, I was in Morelos at a little village called Vicente Aranza. Uh, Vicente Aranza was one of the lieutenants of the famous Emiliano Zapata from Morelos. And so uh, he was a great general uh, and uh, one of two uh, great generals of the Mexican Revolution, I'm talking about approximately 1910. The revolution began really officially uh, a century earlier when uh, Reverend Hidalgo issued uh, a cry of uh, Dolores calling for agrarian return, uh, reform to return the lands that were taken from the people, from the campesinos, by the wealthy landowners back to the people. And it took 100 years and many, many deaths to come to the point um, in around 1910 when uh, Pancho Villa, who operated up around Agua Prieta, in fact, there were two battles of Agua Prieta that Pancho Villa um, orchestrated. Uh, Hollywood had nothing on Pancho Villa. He commandeered uh, one of Cornelius Vanderbilt's trains. He, he had a couple of them, and he crossed the country in this uh, train with his uh, troops and with the bandoliers and the, the uh, uh, weapons that he expropriated from the American soldiers uh, that were provided to the um, government by Woodrow Wilson to fight the revolutionaries in Mexico. And uh, so all of that happened up north around Agua Prieta. I want to talk to you now about Vicente Aranda and Morelos. So it was a tiny village. It was unlike probably a thousand other tiny vi villages at the time in Mexico. It was an ejido. Ejido was created, it really historically went back probably 2.6 thousand years ago, uh, original Mayan structure uh, for the way community agriculture took place. But it was returned uh, by the work of Zapata and other revolutionaries uh, when the uh, Mexican Revolution it took, took effect, these ajitos were reestablished. The land was taken from the wealthy landowners, uh, Randolph Hearst, um, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, John D. Rockefeller, and other Americans, and many other uh, elite wealthy Mexicans, and returned at least temporarily to the people and these ajitos. And Vicente Aranda was no different than the other ajitos. It was a communal form of agriculture. That uh, There were about 30 households there. Each household had its own individual property that it farmed and owned. And uh, then they, they had a large area of communal farm uh, that they worked together uh, the uh, village uh, revolutionary um, authority 
uh, elected a jefe, a chief, and they assigned work um, according to who could do what types of uh, physical labor. And, and then they distributed that, uh, the products, according to need. Now, uh, it's a very crude um, form of living. No running water as we know it, of course, no sewage. This, this, the um, facilities were a barranca or a ditch behind about 30 houses in, a, in the village. Uh, the running water uh, took me about 50 years to really figure this out, so I'm kind of slow. But the, um, the, um, it had a, an Indian name, but the, the locals called it the Rio Seco Dry River that ran in a big loop around Vicente Aranda. And it came um, to a close, uh, didn't quite join. So at the higher end, there was a, um, an irrigation system that served as a place for the uh, people to bathe, to wash clothes, and get their drinking water from. And it um, took me a long time to figure out this. All of the houses there were adobe with either straw. Some had uh, uh, tin roofs, that, but uh, there was nothing constructed, anything like this. Huge granite blocks about three feet wide, and, and this went on for about a quarter of a mile, and uh, every 100 feet or so, there was a sluice gate uh, where uh, irrigation water could go into this massive field and irrigate the land. So as the uh, river turned around the bend there, it, in the high point, it came in, and when they wanted to irrigate the fields, they would release it and it would go down into, um, into the fields. That uh, system was probably at least 1,000, probably closer to 2,000 years old. Uh, it was unlike anything in the village. Uh, I don't think they had any cars or trucks or mechanized equipment at all in that village. Um, uh, our project was to build a bridge uh, across the river. There was a school, um, elementary school for the children in Vicente Aranda, but across the river, uh, there was another village that had no school. And it was a five mile trip around the river to the bridge uh, one way to get to school for those kids. and so. Uh, our project, we took down a uh, pyramid at the top of the hill that was probably 2,000 years old, had really intricate, uh, intricate carvings, and we built a suspension bridge across the river so those kids could come across. So anyway, that was Vicente Aranda. Um, uh, very crude, rudimentary, uh, form of living, but you have to understand that prior to the revolution, those people were vir virtual slaves or serfs, beholden to, with no freedom, um, uh, to a landowner. And it, at least they had the freedom to do as they wanted, work their own land and make their own decisions under the revolution. So it, at least in in uh, 1969, um, thing, the revolution was very much alive. I'm not sure uh, what it is now. I was able to find Vicente Aranda now has a Facebook page, so you can go and look uh, is, uh, in the uh, state of Morelos and look and see more about Vicente Aranda. Um, so anyway, um, in, in the U.S., we uh, have this belief, almost a cult belief, in the uh, cult of American exceptionalism. We believe that we're exceptional in every way and better and smarter 
than anyone else. Well, as we've already heard, uh, part of what we count as America, and we're not really Americans um, compared to, to some people, uh, wasn't really um, part of America to begin with. But anyway, we believe that we're better and smarter, uh, but uh, the Mexicans or Mesoamericans uh, from Belize, Honduras, Guatemala, Yucatan Peninsula, all the way up to Morelos and almost to Mexico City, these Mesoamericans were one of five great ancient civilizations. So what distinguishes the Mesoamerican civilization from Chinese civilization, Indo, um, uh, Indus River uh, area, uh, Mesopotamia, and Egypt and China. What is the dis distinguishing factor? Engineering and architecture, the first pyramids in terms of astronomy, the first calendars a pictographic form of writing that was among the very earliest, but more than anything else, it was agriculture. So, who has eaten corn, beans, squash, sweet potatoes, melons, tomatoes, peppers, papayas, avocados, coffee, chocolate, many other fruits, developed by the Mexicans, the Mayans. In addition, they developed a means of, uh, of uh, releasing corn, uh, the kernels, so it was more digestible and they could utilize the proteins there, uh, usually in combination with beans. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, irrigation, they invent, really invented large scale uh, uh, industrial level irrigation, terracing, and crop rotation. So these were the giants of agriculture who now are um, relegated to coming to South Carolina and other places to pick our fruits and vegetables and crops because um, one of the leading imports um, that... Um, they bring into Mexico is, guess what? Corn made in the United States. So suppose you're, um, uh, fast food thankfully is not big in Mexico. Suppose you were gonna go uh, to the football game uh, between the uh, Tehuixla Tigres and the Cuautla Caballos and you wanted to to pick up something. Well, if it was on Sunday, the uh, really nice Kuala, uh, uh, market would be closed. You'd have to go to the Walmart uh, there in, in Kuala. And this is what you could get. Tostadas, it's really tasty um, uh, corn, um, and uh, good with beans, uh, but uh, this happens to be imported from um, Norcross, Georgia. And um, so frito sauce, uh, peppers and tomatoes, uh, product of uh, Estados Unidos, United States. You could get some beer. Now this was produced in Mexico, but the hops were brought from the United States and the trucks that brought those hops in and brought the beer back were made in the United States as well as a lot of the equipment and brewing. This is uh, the largest import uh, to the United States from all of that agricultural ability 
beer and <laughs> this avocados. Now, another staple crop, um, really popular foodstuff is rice. Never was developed or big in Mexico, but has grown wildly in, in uh, popularity because of its cost and um, big American flag made probably in Arkansas. Uh, and um, so that is a, a very, very popular Mexican dish now, it's rice. Frijoles negros, beans. Estados Unidos, um, product of E, U, E, Estados Unidos, and um, hot tomato sauce. Salsa de chile fresco. So, because of NAFTA, um, North American Free Trade Act, uh, the uh, developing Mexican rice industry doesn't have any place to go because uh, uh, our production capacity is overwhelmed anything the Mexicans could do, particularly in these small ajitos. And so uh, bring in corn and rice and things that are produced in uh, America in the United States much more cheaply than you can in Mexico, uh, including coffee, uh, although we don't make coffee in the United States. So coffee is one of the opportunities uh, to come in. And, and um, so the ajito still operates and the coffee production is a good example of that. It's done cooperatively. So every farmer may own a little bit of land, but they work together for the packaging and and a transport and marketing and developing that, those markets and, and, and uh, selling that coffee. So it's all done cooperatively. So that's a, a key uh, part of Mexican society. And uh, uh, I noticed, um, again, this is really important, the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism the last one here, respect for the interdependent web of existence of which we all are a part. Um, as mentioned earlier, spent more than 50 years in public health, and that is the central tenet of public health. For those 50 years I worked in public health and no one knew what I did until recently. They think they know something now, uh, but they, they really may not know uh, unless they understand that there is no food chain with humans at the top, but there is an interdependent web of life, not just for humans, but all living creatures, and it's closely insinuated with the natural environment, such that a small change in any part of that web of life can have profound implications, not just for that area or that organism, but for the whole world, a small change. Time? Time. So anyway, that's kind of the takeaway message of this, that if you wanna make a difference you can make a difference right here in Columbia. And that you don't have to change the world from Columbia. A small change that you make in Columbia can have profound implications for the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Anna. <laughs> mm. 
Thank you. Thank you so much to Michael and Mary. I'm sure there will be uh, outside to answer any questions that came up. Anna, would you give us closing music, please? Our closing music today features another song by Joe Troop. This song, Mercy for Migrants, is Troop's plea for empathy for those trying to cross the U.S. border, searching for a better life. The track was inspired by a harrowing visit he made to the desert lands around the U.S. border. He wrote the piece after visiting the borderlands in 2019. He says his friend and UCC pastor, Randy Mayer, took us on a walk in the southern Arizona desert to better understand what migrants go through. At one point, we came upon a little white cross with sunglasses on it, placed where the remains of an unknown 16-year-old boy were found. The moment shook him to the core and inspired this song. Desperate hopes of salvation Force you to leave your native land Doomed was the road of migration to mention that the flowers were given today in remembrance of those who have perished on the desert, on the trek to the border. The closing words are adapted by, uh, from writings of Andrew Harvey and Carolyn Baker. Wisdom and integrity demand that all men and women embrace warrior con consciousness, which is not about making more war, but about taking a stand for the earth community and for all of those who are not able to defend themselves against harm 
or injustice. May we all, whatever our age, become a resounding yes to take a stand for the Earth community.